Hey everybody, and welcome back to AP World History in 516. Uh, today we're going to be starting a new section of videos where I spend time reviewing each section. Uh, hopefully by the end of each of these sections, this will serve as a refresher for you, and you may even want to use this as a review as you prepare for the AP test come in May. Um, so I am actually going to skip Unit 1, just because, uh, first off, the AP exam doesn't really cover a whole lot of information from Unit 1. Uh, and then second, most of the information that's covered in Unit 1 is eventually covered in other sections. There's a few things that aren't covered. Um, however, again, there is very little information from Unit 1 on the actual AP test. So for this, we're going to start off with Unit 2, Networks of Exchange. And in particular, uh, we're going to be looking at the Silk Roads. All right, this is Section 2.1 in our AMSCO textbook. If you're using another textbook, things won't quite mirror the same, um, but I'm sure the content is still very similar. All right, so for the Silk Roads, let's go on. Um, this is an image looking at the Silk Road, but it also blends in with the Indian Ocean trade route that's happening again at the same time. And one of the things that I think that we can take a look at is that one, all of these branches of the Silk Road are connected with the Indian Ocean trade route. All right, and what I think is important about that is as we approach the content of the Silk Road and the Indian Ocean trade route, the textbook separates the two, um, almost as if they're separate entities, but actually they're linked together and they're building upon one another and they're both facilitating even more trade. And I think that's something that the textbook doesn't necessarily do a good job of. All right. The second thing to kind of emphasize here are is just the goods that are being traded in particular places. All right. So some places. So, for example, here in Hekolo, uh, Lampilos, um, peach trees, wool rugs, jasmine, tapestry, date palms. These are the major items that are going to be traded um, by these places or the goods that they're going to be created. Here in Antioch, which is in uh, Syria at this time, they have glassware, wooden goods, etc. And it's at this time that we start to see all of these goods being spread across this massive expanse of land. Um, and one of the things that we'll talk about too is that it's not just goods that are being traded, but ideas religions are being established as a result of all of these interactions as well. Which brings us to now the improvements in transportation that are taking place during this time on specifically the Silk Road. All right, the first you'll see there in bold are caravans. Caravans are traveling groups that provide safety. Um, before the Mongols came in and established their empire and established what's referred to as Pax Mongolica, the Silk Road was kind of a dangerous place. It was subject to bandits. It was subject to any sorts of things that, you know, if you were uh, a merchant traveling individually, you had a likely chance of being mugged or attacked or killed. All right. So what people decided to do instead of just traveling individually, they traveled in large groups. And you can kind of see an image representation here where you have the camels who are typically used as the primary source of transportation of the goods. You have perhaps the merchants here in the middle, but also in the very back, it almost appears that they had their own kind of bodyguards that were associated with them to protect them along these roads. All right. One of the things that we'll see in the future is is that this transition from money that is kind of coin-based to cash-based is something else that is going to be a significant improvement for merchants at this time. Going on, we also have the camel saddle. This is a recent development during this time that is used primarily in the transatlantic, or not, sorry, not transatlantic, but the trans-Saharan trade route, rather. Um, and this is something that is developed to increase the, the amount of goods that a camel 
can carry. That's at least one of the saddles. Uh, there are actually several different types of saddles. There are some saddles that allow for multiple people to ride on it at the same time. There are others that allow a rider to sit up higher and therefore give them an advantage in battle. But for this one, this camel, camel, camel saddle was established to be able to allow people to carry more goods. Because again, if merchants are able to carry more goods, the amount of money that they're able to get by selling these goods increases, which kind of further incentivizes their use of the Silk Road and camels. Now, as we go on, um, as we saw in that first image, that map of the expanse of the Silk Road, uh, this is something that is expanding uh, the course of like a thousand or two thousand miles. Uh, and over time, merchants start to understand that they need places that they can stay that are reliable to allow them for uh, safe uh, living arrangements, to allow for their camels to be hydrated, uh, to refresh their supplies, perhaps even trade some of their supplies. And this is where we get what's called the caravanserai. And if there's one vocabulary word that I think is really important from this section, it is caravanserai. These are inns where merchants would travel along, along the Silk Road and they would stop every once, uh, and every once in a while once they got to these. And these were places where they could resupply. They could even perhaps offload some of their goods. And they were typically spread out about a hundred miles apart, which coincidentally happens to be about the distance a camel could go without water. All right, so people started to develop these caravanserai. And I think one thing that you can contextualize, uh, especially going forward, is that these caravanserai started to become popular among Silk Road traders. And as a result, they eventually will turn from caravanserai, which is just the inns, to cities. And that's where I think we see an interesting connection between trade and city development. Next, when we look at transportation and again, things that are happening trade-wise, not necessarily along the Silk Road, but now we're starting to see a transition to the Indian Ocean trade route, we see sea-based travel improvements. So for example, we have the magnetic compass that shows direction. This allows people to be more accurate in where they're trying to go. The same thing with the stern rudder. It allows merchants who are on ships to steer their ship to again, be able to be more accurate with where they're trying to get to. Lastly, here we have the Chinese junk ship, and this is the image that you see here down below. These are massive ships. These are 400-foot ships that are divided into different sections, and what these were really good at beyond just spreading goods or carrying goods is that they were really strong. And when we're thinking about the Indian Ocean trade routes, we have the monsoon seasons that are prohibiting traders, perhaps even providing some detriment to traders because of the weather. We can assume that there were a lot of people that probably lost their lives in ships and cargo as a result of storms. But this Chinese junk ship kind of negates some of those issues, um, not completely but they're at least able to withstand some of the harsher elements if they are trading in the Indian Ocean trade routes. Next, improvements in trade. So when we talk about money, um, there is this development where before paper money, which you can see here up in the top right corner, trade and money was used through copper coins. And if you can imagine, copper is a pretty heavy material. Um, and if you're a merchant, you probably have to have a, uh, a coin carrying chest that's bulky, it's heavy, uh, and it's easy for bandits to come and take it. So one development that's made during this time is something known as flying cash. Uh, and this is something that made money lightweight, easier to transport, and it was widely accepted throughout the Silk Road. The next is we have this idea of credit. So now merchants, instead of having to even carry around coins or flying cash, now they can deposit all of this money at a bank, receive a receipt, and then travel, go on their way, and at an associated bank, they can go present the receipt and then withdraw any of their money. So we're starting to see a lot of developments in making transactions and uh, the carrying of wealth more efficient and more safe. 
And that's where we'll stop. The next video, as you can see right here, we'll be talking about the Mongol Empire and the making of the modern world. You won't want to miss that one because I think this is a really big topic of discussion, especially whenever it comes to potential LEQ or DBQ prompts. All right. That is going to bring an end for me, though. If you like the video, make sure that you like it. If you haven't subscribed yet, go ahead and subscribe. I'm Justin, and this is AP World History in 516. Thanks for watching.